Welcome to this first knowledge clip on the law of the sea. What we are going to see in the next few minutes is how states have progressively declared their sovereignty uh, over different maritime zones, and then we are going to focus on the codification attempts of the 20th century. But first of all, what is the law of the sea? Uh, the law of the sea can be defined as a subfield of general international law which regulates the uses of the sea. Those uses uh, comprise uh, economic activities such as navigation, uh, oil and gas exploitation, but as well renewable energies, um, fishing, of course. But those uses also include the uh, delimitation of the different maritime zones, search and rescue operations, and of course the regime of the deep sea bed area, which is common heritage of mankind. How did we get to uh, this uh, quite diversified uh, legal regime? Well, the first attempts of uh, irradiation of sovereignty by states date uh, back uh, to the uh, Middle Age. Uh, so uh, maritime powers uh, started uh, affirming their sovereignty, their power over quite extensive areas of the oceans. At the same time, uh, some states such as uh, the Netherlands and Belgium also uh, started to declare smaller areas uh, of uh, sea, uh, a sort of very narrow belt along the coast, where they could exercise some uh, security powers, in particular for the control of trade. These areas were called storms. However, a defining moment for uh, the development of the law of the sea um, is the uh, 17th century, uh, where we uh, witnessed the so-called Battle of the Books. In the Battle of the Books, we had on the one hand uh, this gentleman, uh, who was uh, Grotius. Uh, Grotius was a Dutch lawyer, and he was working for the Dutch East Indian Company. And uh, uh, the VOC asked him uh, to develop some legal arguments to sustain their uh, position, which was that uh, the oceans should be uh, free to be used, in particular for navigation, by all maritime powers. Uh, Grotius developed uh, these um, legal arguments in a pamphlet uh, titled Mare Libero. But even in his approach, uh, he uh, recognized the possibility uh, for states to actually exercise control, to exercise sovereignty over a, a belt uh, of a sea along the coast, in particular in relation to uh, security and uh, customs. And this, uh, this uh, narrow area was called Mare Proximum. Against the positions of uh, Grotius and of the VOC, we find the British Empire and his lawyer, this other gentleman, uh, who was uh, John Selden. John Selden uh, developed uh, an, a theory uh, which is called Mare Clausum, on the basis of which uh, any maritime power could actually submit to its own control and sovereignty uh, very extensive areas of the oceans, uh, which might include actually entire oceans. Um, this position, however, uh, was not absolute, and the Selden recognized the possibility uh, for uh, foreign powers to exercise a right of innocent navigation. As you can imagine, in the subsequent years and century, uh, the approach of Grotius prevailed, as it was the one uh, which better responded to the needs of uh, global trade um, and uh, of uh, navigation that uh, maritime powers were interested in. So that's more or less the situation that we have uh, until the uh, 20th century. Uh, you might wonder why states uh, needed to uh, felt the need uh, to uh, actually embark in a codification attempt. Well, uh, the activities at sea were uh, rapidly expanding uh, with the development of new technologies, uh, so new boats as well, which uh, rendered the navigation easier and faster, 
Um, and as well the expansion of some economic activities offshore such as oil and gas. Uh, for instance, the first oil, uh, oil platform uh, were, uh, the first oil platforms were built in the 1930s. So states really felt the need uh, to actually agree on some uh, common rules on these new usages of the sea. So the first attempt uh, actually failed. Uh, it was in the 1930 Hague uh, conference. Uh, unfortunately, at the time, uh, states still had very strong disagreements, in particular in relation to the maximum extension of the maritime zones. Another very important moment is the Truman Proclamation of 1945. Truman was the uh, Secretary of State of the US, and in this proclamation, it uh, he declared the uh, U.S. sovereignty over the so-called continental shelf. The concept of continental shelf was already known at that time, but it wasn't exactly an, a, a well-defined legal concept. And this proclamation uh, triggered, actually, um, other uh, states to do the same, and the concept was uh, integrated already just uh, a few years later in the codification of the end of uh, 1950 in Geneva. Uh, at the, uh, the outcome of uh, this uh, attempt were the four uh, Geneva Conventions, uh, where we have a specific convention on the continental shelf. Uh, this attempt was unfortunately partially successful in the sense that uh, the conventions were widely ratified and there are still in force for some of the states which uh, did not ratify the subsequent convention, but uh, there were still a series of issues which were not solved uh, by, uh, by those conventions, such as uh, the maximum uh, extension of the territorial sea. Those issues then uh, pushed states to actually start a new negotiation uh, only 15 years after uh, the conclusion of the Geneva Conventions. And uh, this uh, third attempt of uh, codifi codifying the law of the sea uh, resulted in the adoption in 1982 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, this uh, convention uh, resolved a series of issues, in particular in relation to the maximum extension of the maritime zones. Uh, it codified a, a series of customary norms, in particular in relation to uh, navigation. Uh, but it also introduced uh, some very important novelties, such as the international regime of the deep seabed area, the in exclusive economic zone regime, and the dispute settlement mechanisms that you find in part 15 of the convention. The convention uh, was a, a quite a peculiar um, product for that time, in the sense that uh, even if it had a universal aspiration, uh, they decided not to allow reservations. So states had to become a party to the uh, convention without the possibility to present reservations. And for that reason, uh, the convention uh, is also uh, was adopted following the so-called package deal approach. For all those reasons, the chairman of the last phase of the negotiations, Ambassador Tommy Koh from Singapore, defined the convention in its last uh, in its last. Uh, declaration in this last statement as the constitution for the oceans. We will see uh, the details of the legal regime of the different maritime zone in the second knowledge clip on the law of the sea.